In Acts the 11th chapter and verse 26, the beloved physician Luke wrote, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. This has reference to Barnabas uh, finding Saul at this time, known as Saul, later becoming the Apostle Paul, bringing him unto Antioch, so Barnabas bringing Saul to Antioch, and they assembling with the church there for a year, teaching many. But we want to center for a minute, just on the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The disciples called Christians. This tells us that if one is a disciple, one is a Christian. Likewise, if one is a Christian, one must be a disciple. The terms obviously do not mean the same thing. Uh, a Christian means like Christ in its very basic meaning. And Christ being anointed one is a translation of the Greek term Christos. Uh, it's the Hebrew Messiah. But it means anointed one, and so like the anointed one, of course, Jesus being the anointed one, we are to be like him. Disciple, on the other hand, we oftentimes refer to the disciple as one who is a follower. Uh, that might be involved and is involved in the idea of a disciple, but disciple literally means one who is a learner. He is sitting at the feet of someone, learning from that individual. And the discipleship implies the aspect is he is learning from him in order to follow his teachings. So while they do not mean the same thing, you have two terms, yet they are referring to the same people, the same group of people. John, in his biographical life of Jesus of Nazareth, gives us a beautiful, a beautiful description of what a disciple is. And so we want to center our study this afternoon and probably next Lord's Day afternoon on John chapter 8 and verse 31 and 32. When it John records, then said Jesus to those Jews which believe on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The first thing we notice in this is our response to the word of God. If ye continue in my word, Jesus says, there's the word of God, then you're my disciples. So there has to be a response to the word of God. As we study the scriptures, we start learning our response to that word. And the very first aspect that we need to consider is that we must desire the word. Jesus in the Beatitudes in Matthew, the fifth chapter, we read that blessed he is he that hungereth and thirsteth, or thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. There is a hungering and a thirsting after God's word, righteousness. And we could go through the aspect that all of God's commands are righteousness. Psalm 119, 172. God's righteousness is revealed in the gospel, Romans 1, 16 and 17. And so when he talks about 
Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. He's dealing really with God's Word. There must be a hungering and a thirsting after that. It's much like that individual who hasn't had any food for a long time. And he's hungry. He desires food. Uh, you know, see the old time movies in which an individual is out in the working outside and all of a sudden the bell is rung for them to come to eat and all everyone comes running because there's a desire to eat. Thirsting. Like the person who hadn't had a drink of water in a long, long time. Spend a couple of days and not have any water. Somebody out on the desert. How much are they desiring a drink of water? That's the attitude that Jesus is setting forth for someone in regards to the Word of God. There is a desire for it. An intense, burning desire for God's Word. Peter puts it in an illustration that we all understand in 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. There's that desire as a newborn babe desires milk, so we desire the word of God. The problem is a lot of times we don't have that desire anymore. There's really the problem with so much of the Lord's church today. We have no longer a desire, an intense, burning desire for God's Word. Years ago, someone was being suggested for a gospel meeting. And one of the objections that came was that he preaches too much Bible. That illustrates... And that's a true illustration. That's not just a preacher's story. That's true in the situation. It indicates an individual, at least, that does not really have a desire for God's Word. So many sermons in the Lord's church have very little Bible in them. I remember years ago attending... A a service, I hate to call it a worship service, a congregation that overflowing, just growing the leaps and bounds. And there was one passage used in the entire, well, it wasn't really a sermon. And I'm not talking about a passage in which Someone just goes through the passage in, the ex, in an exposition of the passage. It was instead short stories, moralizing, making everyone feel good. There was no desire for God's Word in that congregation in reality. They had a desire for all of these other things and all of these other ideas that would make them feel good, that would... Give them a good feeling going out and they would moralize as to how to be good neighbor, how to take care of your finances, and all of these other things. But there was really no basis of anything in God's Word. There has to be first that desire of God's Word. Sadly, we've lost that desire. Congre or individuals leave a worship service and they go home and they set their Bible aside and they'll pick it up, time for the next service, and bring it with them. But there's no, nothing that they do with that Word of God during the week. It's because they don't have a desire for it. If we really had a desire for it, you know, we can read Facebook, we can read Twitter, we can do uh, you know, all of these other things, 
but how many will spend the time reading the Bible? I've got to catch up on my friends over here on my Facebook list, and I've got to see what they're doing, but what about reading the Bible? Where is our real interest? Or I can watch an uh, hour-long TV show or go to a movie, or movie bring, bring movie into our house now, and watch a couple hours on that, but I don't have time to read the Bible. The problem isn't that we've simply become ignorant. The problem really goes back to there's no desire for it. We've lost a desire for God's work. Maybe we've been inundated with uh, the false idea, well, you know, the Bible really isn't relevant for us today. We've been told that so many times. How many of us, while we don't believe it, yet it has affected our life. That's our first response in regards to God's Word. Our second response needs to be a study of the God's Word. Paul telling the young preacher Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, American Standard, I realize, translates it, Give diligence. The idea is you spend the time with it in order to know it, to learn it. Do we have and have we studied it in such a way that we know the general purpose of the Bible? What is the general theme of the Bible? Well, obviously it's the salvation of man through Jesus Christ and his death upon the cross. Do we have an understanding that it's divided into two great divisions, the Old Testament and the New Testament? And that while the Old Testament it begins with, for example, three periods of time dealing with all men, all right, there's the antediluvian period, pre-flood, post-diluvian period, and then the period of the fathers. How many of us know those periods? Have we studied them enough to know the way in which the Bible is even divided for us? And then you come to Mount Sinai in which God deals with primarily the Jews in giving them the law of Moses. And you continue on as they are taken into bondage, as we see them come out of bondage. And we see them taken into the land, of, or there's a period of wilderness wanderings, and then taken into the period of conquest in which they take that land which God has promised them. These are different periods of time. You finally come to the period of the judges, and the 15 judges that there are there. And after the judges, there is because the people cried for a king, that God gave them a king. And you have a period of a united kingdom in which all of the tribes were united under the kings. Three of the kings that they were united under, Saul, David, and Solomon. Do we know those simple things? To have an understanding of God's word. And you just continue from there through that Old Testament till you come to the New Testament period. And then you have the life of Christ and the different divisions in relationship to the life of Christ. Then as the apostles go out to preach that word, you have a period of confirmation, the book of Acts, a historical book in which the gospel is being spread in the world. And then those epistles being written to different uh, individuals and congregations. You have the general epistles written by Paul, and then you go into some other general epistles before you finally come to the book of Revelation, a book of prophecy. Now, those are very basic things in understanding the Bible, yet so many Christians couldn't tell you heads or tails of it. 
Why? Because they haven't spent the time and the effort studying. Now, study takes time and it takes effort. It takes work. I think I like the way in which Paul puts it to Timothy. A workman. This is effort that has to be put forth. And sitting down with God's Word and learning, spending the time, spending the effort, in actually learning what it says. Come to a word, I don't understand it. What do you do? Oh, I'll just read over it. (laughs) Just go on, uh, because, you know, it's not all that important anyway. Or do we, oh, wait a minute, I don't know what this word means. Let me get over here to a dictionary, Bible dictionary preferably, and see what it means. That's study. That's something we have to do, and yet we don't do it far enough. Study God's Word. Then a third thing is to meditate on it. As Joshua is about to lead the children of Israel, Moses has died. Joshua now is going to be called to lead the children of Israel into the land of of Canaan, the promised land. And God appears to him, gives him a charge, as we might refer to it. And in chapter 1 of the book that bears his name, in verse 8, it says, The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Notice what is necessary. This is God speaking to Joshua. What is it necessary on Joshua's part to do what God says and not depart from it. Notice what is necessary for Joshua's way to be prosperous, for Joshua to have good success. He sets forth two things in reality. The law, the book of the law, shall not depart of thy mouth. And the second thing is, thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Meditation has taken on a a negative connotation in our society because of the oriental influence of transcendental meditation in which you basically try and clear your mind of anything and everything and they might say get in touch with your body and your feelings and uh, effort of nothingness. And so when we talk about meditation, we all, oftentimes our mind goes to that. <laughs> meditation, as far as a biblical idea is concerned, is simply thinking about what you have studied. The study comes first. It is absolutely essential. Knowing what the text says... But then we meditate on it in the sense we think upon it. We dwell upon it. That's meditation. And it's something that we don't do enough of. Now, again, notice Joshua is told, you've got to, first, the law is not to depart out of your mouth but you've got to meditate upon it in order to observe to do it, in order that your way can be prosperous, in order that you have good success. You must meditate upon the Word. That is, you think about it, you dwell upon it, you keep it in your mind all of the time. 
I thought about telling a story of not too long ago. A study had taken place, gone past it in reality. But in the middle of the night, literally the middle of the night, I woke up. Why didn't I think of this earlier? And I thought of a passage. I need to put that, and could not go back to sleep. I had to get up and go put it in notes so I wouldn't forget it. The mind continuing to think upon God's Word. All the time, day and night. Meditate therein day and night. Your mind is so centered upon God's Word that you can't think about anything else, in fact. In the description of the blessed man by David, first Psalm, verse 1, of course, tells us what he does not do. But then verse 2, he tells us what the blessed man does. And he says the first thing is, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And then the second thing is, in his law doth he meditate day and night. That's the blessed man. The study, yes, has to be there, and we have to know the material, we have to know the Bible as a whole. But then we start thinking about it, and we, yes, meditate upon it, we dwell upon it, we think, how does this apply? Go back to Joshua again. You meditate so that you can observe to do it. In other words, there's going to be things coming up in your life. Now, how did I overcome that in order to do all that God has said? Because I'm thinking about God's Word. I'm meditating upon it. I'm seeing how this passage relates to this. Go back to and think about Jesus. And this is going to tie in to a great extent with the next point that we're going to make. But here Jesus is tempted of Satan. First temptation, for example, turn these stones into bread. You're out here hungry. You hadn't eaten in 40 days and 40 nights. Now then, think, put yourself in his position. And what would you think of? Well, there wouldn't be anything wrong with that. I mean, I can eat that way. Provide me food, need food. But Jesus uses a verse back over in Deuteronomy that says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Would we, of course we have the record of it taking place, but if we didn't have that record, we didn't know what took place, would we be able to take that and to apply it to that situation? Meditation is what does that for us. So that we're thinking, okay, here's this passage. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And now then Satan comes along and says, so I turn these stones into food. Oh, food isn't all that's necessary. It's the word of God. and Every word that proceeds out of the word of God, that's what's necessary. That's meditation, how that passage applies to the situation. So that when the situations come up, I've already thought about it. Because I've been meditating on the passage. I've been thinking about it. I've been dwelling upon it. And so when something comes up in our life, we're not just totally caught off guard by it and totally surprised by it. Why? We've already been thinking about how the Scriptures apply to those types of situations. 
Thus, when they come up, I can overcome the sin and the temptation. And I can, as Joshua is told, do, observe to do all that is written therein. Because I've used my mind in thinking about what God has said. But then fourth is we hide it in our heart. Psalmist said in 119th Psalm in verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Jesus had God's word in his heart, in his mind in his thoughts, so that when he was tempted, he could call upon God's Word. We need to have God's Word so much within us, in our mind, hiding it in our heart, so that when we need a passage of Scripture, it comes up, because we've got it in our minds. We've hid it in our hearts. That's the way in which to overcome sin. If we don't have it in our hearts, though, in our minds, then how are we going to use it in overcoming sin? The problem is we're going to succumb to the sin. Now, in order to hide it in our hearts, put it in our minds, what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to spend time studying it and meditating upon it. And without that, we won't have any Word of God in our minds. But look at what people think about today. Just consider all of the frivolous things in our society that our minds are centered upon. And we never get to that which is of utmost important, the Word of God. Then fifth... We need to live according to it. In Hosea chapter 14 and verse 9, Hosea says, Who is wise, and he shall understand these things? Prudent, (coughs) and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressor shall fall therein. Wise, understanding, the prudent man, what is it? He knows that the ways of the Lord are right, and the just will walk in them. That is someone who lives according to God's Word. Jesus puts it in Luke, the sixth chapter, in verse 46, Why call ye me Lord, Lord? And what? You do not do the will or do not the things which I say. You see, we have to apply that word in our life so that we are living according to it. What good does it do to have God's word but not live according to it? That's what Jesus is addressing here. Could they, the people that he was talking to, have said, why, here's what you said. Yes, they probably could have in many instances, but they didn't do it. They didn't follow through with it in life. James puts it in James, the first chapter, in verse 22, to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. From a personal standpoint, this is just me talking, and other preachers probably feel the same way many times. One of the most disappointing things as a preacher is to preach your heart out about some subject, and then people go out and do exactly the opposite. They don't do what you've taught. And you almost at times just want to throw up your hand and say, why continue? That seems to be the problem with Jesus here. You're calling me Lord, Master, Ruler, 
yet you won't do what I'm saying. We've got to take that word and we have to actually follow through with it in life. Doers of the word, not hearers only. And notice in what James says there, be doers of the word, not hearers only. What? Deceiving your own selves. If you think you're a follower of Jesus and you're a Christian, and you're a disciple, but you don't do what the Word says, then you're self-deceived. You're not. The only way to be a true disciple of Jesus is to follow through in life with what is taught. Now, in order to know what is taught, I've got to study it, and I've got to meditate upon it, and I've got to start then, yes, applying it to the life, hiding it in my heart, applying it to our life. I have to do all of those things. But so many times we just, yeah, we hear the word, but it has no effect upon us in our life. Until we start learning to actually apply what God says to our life, then it, we're deceiving ourselves. We're not what we claim. Then six, we need to teach it. First, we need to teach it to our children. In the Old Testament, as Moses gives the second giving of the law, what took place at Mount Sinai, God gave them the law. They, because of rebellion and unbelief, they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until that generation was passed out or passed away. They come to the, now the fords of the river of Jordan. Before they pass over into Canaan land, that promised land, there is a second giving of the law. He re, Moses reiterates what the law was. That's the book of Deuteronomy. And as he begins that reiteration of the law, he says, as recorded in Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through verse 9, These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. See, that we've talked about that. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way. And when thou liest down. And when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them as signs upon thy hand. And they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. You teach God's word to your children. And notice the emphasis. When the, uh, you talk of them, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you get up, Now then, is that sitting down with the Bible and reading it? No, that's having that Bible hid in your heart because you've studied it and you know what it says. And as you're living your daily life, you're teaching it to your children. You're making application of God's Word to them. Something comes up in life. You know, here's how God's Word applies to it. Here's what God's Word says about this. And you're always, at all times, every day, applying God's Word and teaching that Word to your children. A lot of parents can't do that because they don't have any knowledge of God's Word themselves. Teach it to your children. 
And the responsibility is especially given to fathers in Ephesians 6 and verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Teach your children. Bring them up. Discipline them. In God's Word. They need to know the Word because they've been taught it all of their life as they grow up. But we need to be also teaching it to others. Preaching God's Word to those lost. We live in a society today that very, very, very few people that we meet are Christians. We're not talking about New Testament Christians. We're not talking about denominations. But even in our society, even if you included the denominational world, the majority of people are, as it's called now, unchurched. I despise that term. But it expresses an idea that we understand. Those that attend denominations are just as unchurched as the person who doesn't attend. Because they're just as lost. And they're just as much in need of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But even if you include all of those that attend denominational groups, the majority of our society today don't even attend. They fall into that category that the world puts as unchurched. But the denominational world needs it just as much as anyone else, the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're lost and they're going to spend an eternity in torment. And let me tell you, God's not going to come down and tell them directly what they need to do to be saved. He's not going to send an angel to them and say, I'm an angel and uh, here's what you need to do. God has given that responsibility to us as Christians. He has deposited into our hands His Word. We're the ones who are charged with the responsibility of teaching the lost. All of the lost. We need to be about our Father's business of saving and doing our job in teaching the lost. But then there's also the edification of those who are saved. Part of the reasons that we have a Bible class on Sunday morning, part of the reason we have Bible classes on Wednesday night, is to further study God's Word. Part of the preaching aspect is, yes, teaching others who are Christians. Peter recognized, just go through Second Peter sometime and see how many times he talks about, I'm going to bring these things to your remembrance even though you know them. I'm going to say them again even though you know them. Why? Because he knew the need for teaching and yes, that means teaching things that people already know. So there's that need for edification, for building us up. As we study and as we listen, we need to be learning God's Word. So that yes, we can hide it in our heart, meditate upon it, apply it to our lives, so that we can live faithfully to God. In Ezra 7 and verse 10, Ezra, it makes a beautiful statement concerning Ezra when it says that he had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. He had prepared his heart, that's the first thing, that's a desire. He had a desire for God's Word. Prepared his heart to seek the law. That's studying it. Seeking after it. Meditating upon it. To do it, applying it to his life, and then to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. 
I'm going to teach it to others as well. How we need more Ezra's in the church of our Lord today. But very briefly, as we sum up this first lesson, what happens when we do not continue in that word? Isaiah puts it in Isaiah 5 and verse 13. Therefore my people are gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished, and their multitudes are dried up with thirst. In other words, God's word was void in their lives, and as a result, they went into captivity. Hosea puts it in Hosea 4 and verse 6 that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Destroyed, rejected by God, because they don't know God's word. Lack of knowledge. They had the capability, they had the ability, they had the availability of God's law, but they did not know it. We have the availability of God's law to us. We have the capability of studying it and learning it. We have so much available to us as Christians today as far as being able to study God's Word that it's unbelievable. You, can't, you could spend 24 hours a day and not even cover everything. As far as studying even one particular passage. But do we take the time, do we put forth the effort to study it? Destroyed, rejected. Why? Because we did not study God's Word. No knowledge of God. What's your condition? Are you that one who has, based upon God's word, obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ in becoming a Christian? If you have, have you lived faithful in the way in which God has set forth, knowing God's word within your life, applying it to God, your life? If you've fallen away from that application and you've gone back into sin, then let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins. And thus have that blessedness that God will bless his children with, with an, and with that hope of an eternity with God in heaven. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitations.